Good evening. I'd like to call to order the first committee of the whole meeting of the 2014-2015 season. Um, we will have a roll call vote uh, regarding attendance. Um, yes, there are 14 present. Um, Alderman Matichak and Alderman Van Akron are not here. Uh, Alderman Van Akron is excused. Alderman Matichak is not excused. Would you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Oh, and um, I'm sorry, Mark. It's our understanding that um, Alderman Herman will be here. Um, that had been my understanding. We, we just saw him, so I'm not sure. All right. We're not sure at this point, so we may, <laughs> we may be at 13. <laughs> pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> um, item 1.5 is our public forum. I understand uh, Ms. Dulcie Johnson wishes to speak at the public forum. If anyone else, the rules here are a little different. If anyone else is uh, interested in speaking before uh, within the terms of the public forum, that would be fine too. You just after Ms. Johnson is done, we'll take it from there. <clears throat> It's okay. Dulcie, can we have your home address, please? 1306 North 3rd Street, Sheboygan. Thanks. <clears throat> I'll scrunch over here. <laughs> okay. Chairman Donahue and members of the council and citizens, <clears throat> I would like to present my opinion as a citizen, a constituent, a voter, and a taxpayer on the subject of appointing our city attorney. Throughout the history of the city, the citizens have always supported being able to vote for various governmental officials. There have been several attempts to change the city attorney position to an, attempted, to an appointed one, but the citizens have always rejected that change. More recently, there was an attempt to make the city clerk's position appointed, but that was also rejected by the citizens. I attended two meetings of the Salary and Grievance Committee when they discussed the idea of appointing our city attorney. I do not support appointing our city attorney for two reasons. First, due to Governor Walker's erosion of home rule, po home rule policies as a payoff to the Milwaukee Fire and Police, who strongly supported his election, no city, village, or town in Wisconsin can require residency as a condition of employment. Thus, an appointed city attorney could live anywhere in Wisconsin, maybe even in Illinois, I don't know. An elected city attorney would have to be a resident of the city. To the best of my knowledge, all but one of our department heads live in the city, the exception being our human relations director, who does not even live in Sheboygan County, but rather in Two Rivers. I feel strongly that employees of a city should live in the city where they work, be a member of our community, and help pay the cost of their high wages and benefits. In a conversation with our new fire chief, it was refreshing to hear him express that same thinking. Indeed, he relocated to the city of Sheboygan within a matter of a couple of months. And our new library director <clears throat> moved his family here as soon as he accepted the position. Second, Attorney McLean stated <coughs> that he liked the idea that he was elected by the citizens because it removed any fear of upsetting the council and of possibly being removed if the council did not like his advice. He stated that independence was important and that the majority of city attorneys in Wisconsin are elected. True, all attorneys are responsible to their clients and in a private situation, if a person does not like the way their attorney represents them, they can dismiss them. But that analogy with an appointed city attorney is quite different in my mind. The timing of the matter is also an issue. 
If the council should pass the charter ordinance, citizens would have 60 days to petition for a referendum and the city clerk would have 30 days to validate the signatures. The county clerk needs to have a referendum six weeks before the election to get it on the ballot. So the timeline is tight and it is possible that a referendum would not be on the November ballot. In this case, the council would have to call a special election or defer the referendum to the April election, which would be the same election for a new city attorney. I urge you to let the citizens of Sheboygan continue to vote for our city attorney and keep the position an elected one. Thank you. Thank you, Dulce. Is there anyone else who would care to speak before the forum? All right, seeing no one, uh, we will move on to uh, number 2.1. A presentation by the Chamber of Commerce representatives regarding tourism and staff reorganization. Delighted to welcome our representatives. If you come up to the podium. Ordinarily, folks, I feel more comfortable kind of walking around, so I'll be a little tight probably behind the podium. So um, I can't tell you how excited I am to represent the Chamber. I'm uh, Chamber of Commerce president, and today I have with me Betsy Alice, who is the Chamber executive director. We have Terry Lillisand that is part of the chamber board and uh, um, part of the tourism committee. And we have Amy Wilson who um, kind of manages and runs the marketing programs for the tourism group. I'd like to tell you a little bit about some neat <coughs> things that are going on with the chamber and our promotion of Sheboygan. Um, it's hard not to end up having a, a sense of excitement when we start seeing all the cool things that are happening in, in our community. And that's also true with the chamber. We feel the energy, we see things happening, we see the bid district getting involved, we see more people coming into the community from a tourism standpoint, and all of that activity starts to require a different way that you think to administer services. And a little bit is uh, where the chamber started to rethink in terms of how do we provide services, and we're a community service organization. We provide services for our membership, we provide services to promote our community, and we provide services through the room taxes currently with, uh, with the city, and we administer those. So one of the neat things about, uh, about some of the things we're going to talk to you today, uh, or about today, is um, a more efficient way we feel of uh, the way services can be provided, and having a broader base of expertise that we can work with. So I'd like to point out a couple of things why tourism is currently working and what some of the challenges are if there's different approach to the way tourism, and tourism would work. So do I move the slides? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Clicker? I can just click. Okay. Um, tourism by its very nature is uh, a, cyclical, um, a, cyclic, a cyclical work. Uh, whether we want to believe it or not, in the wintertime, things get to be a little more complicated. In the summertime, with all the activities, all of the festivals, all of the events, the level of intensity is far greater, uh, meaning that there are times where there needs to be more resources brought to the table and other times during the year where other resources might be diverted and, and go into other activities. The Chamber has an awful lot of expertise. Uh, people who are good at marketing, good at promotion, good at social media, good at public relations, good at general organization, and that currently it is our goal to incorporate all of those people into the services that we provide to tourism. <coughs> so unlike uh, a model that we may have had that is really uh, employee-based, where we have one or two people who are assigned to tourism, that base gets much larger uh, and there's more bang for the buck and more expertise that can come in there. So rather than actually working of hiring employees, we're looking at hiring services. And that would be our proposal that, uh, that we're going to review with you today. Um, the community already perceives the chamber, uh, rightly or wrongly, as the headquarters of where tourism is administered. So um, Usually the first call is somebody looks in the, in the phone book or dials up on the internet and they look up and they say, Sheboygan, I want to see what that's all about. They probably go to the Chamber website and then find out what activities are there. So the phone calls come in, community perception, outside world's perception is that the Chamber already manages those resources. Um, leveraging. Um, 
as most of you know, if you're, and, and I know we have some representatives from the press, but if you have a single buy in a newspaper, an advertisement of one type or another, you buy that once, it's quite expensive. If you buy it multiple times, it gets far cheaper. And that's true on all media buying, whether it's uh, billboards, whether it's uh, uh, TV, whether it's radio, whether it's print. Uh, each one of those, um, the chamber has the ability to leverage up the other activities that we currently have going on with our membership and apply those rate savings to tourism so that we're able to get a better buy. Uh, connectivity to businesses. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, one of our, our slogans is that we're better together. Uh, right now we have, Betsy, last count was what, 924 chamber members. 20, 924 businesses that believe in this community, that have employees in this community, that play in this community, that we have connections to. In fact, there's an after hours out at the Blind Horse right after uh, that we're hoping to stop in where people talk. They talk about community issues, they talk about tourism, they talk about problem solving, they talk about a lot of things in addition to what's going on in the formal uh, municipal part of the government. Um, businesses, rightly or wrongly, may perceive that uh, government is inefficient. We know that's not true in Sheboygan, but a general perception may be that uh, government may not be as efficient and may be a little more wasteful uh, from a spending standpoint. So perception a lot of times becomes reality in people's minds. We're not arguing whether that's right, wrong, or indifferent. We're just saying that there might be a perception that government may not be uh, as efficient uh, as a private business may be. And I think Amy probably has already recited when she does her presentations that we have a phenomenal, phenomenally great historical track record. Um, that uh, the, the heads, heads and beds, I think that's what we're referring to this as, um, you know, in addition to all of the neat things that we have going on and the economy improving, but each quarter we're seeing more and more folks come to enjoy our community. And as the resources are expanded and as the friendliness of our community and as the business community starts to grow, we're still a very well-kept secret. And from a chamber standpoint, and I think from a tourism standpoint, we're hoping that when people come to visit, that they're gonna come and live here. They're gonna become our employees. Because a lot of times it takes that tourism, the, that tourist person who comes here to say, you know, this would be a great place to live, or it's a great place to come back and spend my money in the restaurants, in the hotels, in, and do my shopping. So we think that the chamber offers a, a tremendous value in terms of uh, administering uh, tourism dollars, and you have our dedication promise that that will continue in the future. So uh, right now we're going to chat a little bit about what has happened within the chamber, and I think Betsy is in the best position to do that. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm not sure that's true. I think Steve did a great job of explaining it. Um, now I'll learn to use this gizmo. Okay, there we go. That was easier than I thought. I'm Betsy Alice. I'm the executive director of the Sheboygan County Chamber. And I have to say, just an introduction, I was thrilled when I accepted this position in 2010 that work was already underway to begin to bring tourism back to the chamber and, so that we could work with the city of Sheboygan. Um, it's been a, a wonderful adventure, and we've learned a whole lot along the way. And I think as, as we grow together, um, you're going to see a lot more uh, going on. And I want to start just, I'm going to give you a little background about how this transpired. Um, in the fall of last year, we started to look at, uh, in a staff retreat, the, the amount of talent that we had and the, the various people who brought different things to the table um, in the chamber. We realized we need to optimize staffing costs. We have li limited funds, both for tourism and for the chamber, and we want to maintain um, a good fiscal model for doing things and delivering services. Um, as the leader of the organization, I want to have a good plan for career development. I'm keenly aware of succession and what will happen. I mean, we could have an entirely different looking chamber five years from now, and I want to make sure that we have that underway and that planning and those people are developing toward the careers that lie ahead for them, and I'd like them to stay, if at all possible. Um, and so as a result of that retreat, um, we began to identify and adopt a new operating model. 
I want to say it's not hugely different, but it looks very different, and I believe that the way we can deliver services through it, because it's much more horizontal and, and employs the talents of everyone, um, in the long run it's going to be a very successful model. Um, and it, we just really started using the model in about May, a um, little bit in April, some in May, and in June finally began fully using it. Um, and I think we're going to learn a lot in the next year, as I've talked with Jim Omodio. Um, you know, we're not sure exactly how this will play out in terms of tourism in the chamber, um, but certainly we need to do our best by both. So that's the intention. Uh, this is our former organizational chart, and the, really the only thing I want to say about this as example is I'm going to use one of our um, unrelated uh, projects just to give you an idea of how this works. These are what we would call silos now in looking at it. And you've all heard that term in business. Um, some of you have experienced that uh, term. But it, it, it puts people in a position where, let's just say we have Lisa Hartman, who is the person who was heading up um, our safety committee or our coastal connections program. And Lisa Hartman's skill is administrative. But Lisa Hartman was responsible for administration, marketing, uh, everything having to do with those things, rather than being able to call upon a team to support her in that process. So the same thing was happening in tourism. There are people with particular skills heading it up, and that will actually remain so. We'll still have a big focus on those people's positions. Um, I should change to the new one so that you can see it. Um, so, you know, what, what we have now is we have facilitators, we have directors, we have people who have a primary accountability for things, and then they can call upon a whole team that's comprised of accounting, marketing, um, all the things that they're going to need to actually do the work and get it done. And those people are at different levels, depending on the complexity of the work, um, in order to, to um, have sound fiscal approaches now we have a whole range of people at different salary levels and experience levels who can provide some of those services. I think one of the good examples is um, for, you know, I think Terry was mentioning earlier, some of the things associated with 4th of July. Previously, we had two people doing an entire project um, with a little bit of support from some of the uh, support staff in terms of accounting and, and uh, you know, answering phones. But now we can call upon people at all levels to, to participate in that event. So this is how our program looks now. These are the kinds of, um, what you see down here are committees. I apologize, some of them are um, acronyms. TASC is actually the Countywide Tourism Association. They, those people work from various parts of our county together to do some work together. So what's this, what, this, what our team is called now is an adaptive cultural structure. And what that means, it, it makes us more nimble. It also evens things out across the year as we have peaks and valleys. Um, there are times, as Steve mentioned, like the 4th of July, where pff, all hands on deck. Um, there are other times where we have our gala for the chamber where we need some additional support. So, so throughout the year now, we believe that we'll have a much more... Um, even approach to things and the ability to scale up or down depending on what the needs are of our constituents. Um, we don't have silos anymore, or we hope we won't have silos anymore. Some may occur over time and then we'll realize it and, and change the way we're working. Um, we have more resources to create superior products or services. We have the ability to match the job to the talent and the experience level for cost containment and efficiency, and I would say for quality as well. Our committee members are no longer performing back office tasks. You know, these kinds of things are, are better suited to um, a staff to give them that support behind the scenes, just as you have with city <coughs> staff to help you do your work better. Um, we have improved cross-communication among and between staff and committees, and this is so evident. Um, right out of the chute, a couple of things happened um, that I could see. First of all, we have people working together, collaborating, coming up with ideas, and helping each other all along the way. It's kind of, you know, whatever is needed, you will find here. 
and we will make sure that we do the very best possible job rather than staying in our particular area. Um, there, aren't, there isn't any of the, it, that's really not my area anymore. And that's a really refreshing way to work. Um, one example, um, you, as you know, or some of you know, we are looking at the possibility of a marine sanctuary on our shoreline, which will be a huge tourist um, attraction. Along with that, it will also be an educational opportunity for um, those schools that are involved in STEM programs, those students who have interest in science and technology. And there may even be the development of a new big facility um, for science and technology. Well, there's a bridge there that the chamber can, can easily navigate because we have committees set up. We have a committee called the Business Education Partnership Group. They were very excited to hear about this new development in tourism. And we were able to bring the people associated with that into that group to see how we can work as a community. So when we say integration, it really is truly integration where, where um, ideas become bigger and we can gain more support for ideas across our community um, with tourism being a very active partner in that rather than being a project. Um, our volunteers have time to develop, to focus on designing programs aligned with our chamber vision. And all of our stakeholders are working toward one vision. Um, and I think the last point is probably one of the primary reasons that initially I began to think about this in very positive terms, and that is succession. You know, people come, people go, but we have a commitment to, con to continue the kind of service that we provide for tourism. And we can do that through a variety of people. The Sheboygan County Chamber vision is to promote business growth and success. And, and, and I want you to know that we think of tourism as a primary business sector in our county and in our community. Um, it creates a huge number of jobs. Amy's the statistic person. Um, it, it brings a lot of dollars into the economy, and it's a very important part of business, and the chamber is all about business. Uh, so promote business growth and success is, is our vision as a chamber of commerce. Um, this is a more elaborate, kind of wordy way to look at our vision, but there is a line in here that I wanted to relate. Um, about the second one down, it says, this is the place visitors and new residents will find the resources needed to make their stay memorable and repeatable, or to encourage them to put down roots here. Um, that's the aspect, I think, that touches most upon the tourism part of what we do. And the rest of it is um, related to all kinds of things. If you'd like a copy, I'd be happy to send you one. Um, so the Chamber's vision provides the building blocks for our image overall. And it's, it's interesting what Steve noted earlier about the Chamber being the natural place people go. That is always the case anywhere, any community in the United States. It's interesting, unless there's a separate convention and visitors bureau. When I was the chamber director in Manitowoc County, we used to get hundreds of calls related to tourism, but we really didn't handle tourism in that county. Um, there was a CVB, there was a chamber, and there was an EDC. So, you know, it just it varies depending on where you are. But in that case, people thought of the chamber as the go-to place. I mean, they obviously think of the CVB right off the freeway as a go-to place also. So now Terry Lillisand is going to talk about the impact uh, this has on tourism. As Steve mentioned, I sit on the chamber board, and I'm also the board member who sits on the um, tourism committee. Chad is our um, the head of the, the uh, committee. And uh, we have Amy, and there's other stakeholders from the hotels, Blue Harbor. The mayor sits on that committee. So I'm going to try to bring this all together. Betsy talked about how the chamber is changing, and I'm going to try to tell you how, what that means for tourism. And honestly, I think it's going to be a good thing for tourism. So let's talk about tourism. What's its purpose? Well, it's to implement and promote, uh, implement promotion and development in initiatives that attract overnight visitors to increase the tourism economy in the area. Tourists come, they stay in our hotels, they pay room tax dollars. Room tax dollars are collected. The city is, is the one to collect the dollars from the various hotels. And the chamber has been contracted by the city to use those room tax dollars to increase tourism. So the more tourists we get, 
the more money we have to increase more tourists. So it's kind of a cir circular thing. The more money we have, the more we can bring in. Promotion and development activities. That's where Amy has really has spearheaded. She's been responsible for the promotion and developmental initiatives for tourism. I mean, Amy is our expert. She was hired specifically for that purpose, to get tourism up and running and be strong and viable. You know, we want Sheboygan to be viable. Um, we have, Amy's been very successful. Room tax dollars have gone up. You guys can get the statistics somehow. Amy probably has them memorized, she can tell you. Um, but that's been the purpose. And this is not necessarily much different with the Chamber's alignment and its vision. I mean, the Chamber wants to promote Sheboygan. We want to have successful businesses. We want to bring people to the area. Our employers need employees. We want people to come. Tourism wants people to come, to spend money here. So the vision is very, very um, common. All right, so under the new chamber structure, in terms of how the work at the chamber is performed, that does have an impact on how the work of tourism is performed, but it's really going to be favorable. We still have one primary individual. That's going to be Amy. Her primary focus is still on tourism. She's the expert. I sit in those tourism committee meetings, and she can cite exactly what market we need to go after, how we're going to do that, what advertising work. She knows all that, and that's the highest and best of use, use of her time. The highest and best use of her time is not ordering porta potties for the Fourth of July activities. Somebody else at the chamber has better and more experience and can, should be doing that. Amy should be focusing on chamber, act, you know, those tourism activities. That is not going to change. <clears throat> The tourism board is an important part of the tourism activities, and that composition is not changing. We have, we have the, me, the board member from the chamber, Amy sits on that board, Chad is our head, the mayor still will be there, and we have representatives from the various hotels. The stakeholders are there, that is not gonna change. Really, the, the purpose of this reorganization for the chamber is really to leverage the employees' best and highest use. I mean, we all do that in our own businesses. We want to have people that have the skills and use that, those skills to the best of our ability. And so some of the mundane things that Amy and some of the other tourism people have been doing are now going to be done at different levels, at the appropriate levels, so that Amy and her team for tourism can really focus on what's the best use of our time? How do we get more tourist, tourists here? I mean, that really is what we should all be focusing on is really let's get more people here because the more the better. Um, and again, using the chamber, having the chamber be the tourism vehicle, I guess, you know, we have a wide reach throughout the community in terms of the businesses, the restaurants, the hotels. And so we have the ability to touch a lot more stakeholders and hopefully be more successful. All right. So again, I really think that while there's some changes internally with the, with the um, chamber in terms of how work is being done, Tourism is not going to change in terms of its results, in terms of the goals that we're trying to accomplish. Amy's still going to be responsible. We may have some other people helping, like tonight. Part of what we have to do for the city is, our, is the um, uh, concerts at Fountain Park. Well, Amy might not be here tonight because she would have been responsible for that, but now we have Lisa going to do that. So again, her best use of her time tonight is to be here to answer questions not to worry about the concert tonight necessarily. So again, we hope that this is very favorable. We think it's very favorable change. We think that you'll actually, the room tax dollars um, will go further because we have, we have people at different levels doing the, some of the work. Again, porta potty ordering is not something that we want Amy to do. We want her to do something that's gonna bring more tourism in. So I don't know, do we open it up for questions? Are we gonna have a summary here? Okay. <coughs> Yeah, I did ask the, the mayor if, if anybody had any questions. Um, I would be a little bit remiss if I uh, uh, probably didn't extend uh, probably an apology of the chamber has taken on these activities with the best of intentions. Um, however, our communication to some folks within the city it was probably not what it should have been. And the last thing we want to do is surprise people. So what I would hope that you would leave tonight is you would understand that the chamber is going to add value and that we are going to be doggone efficient at what we do and we are going to be accountable. 
So you know, the accountability piece, I think, got missed a little bit of saying that we're working for the city, we're working for those hotel owners, we're working for the tourists that are coming here so that they know what, what's happening. But we didn't really do a good job with that. But you know what? We learned from that. So I would be remiss if I didn't say something to, you know, to Chad, to Jim, you know, to the mayor. Uh, we're doing our presentation to you folks uh, a little bit almost after the fact. Uh, while we believe in the structure, that, that process of how we got here maybe is, uh, I can say like making sausage, but that would sound uh, a little too trite. <laughs> no one wants to see it being made. But uh, So that aside, um, uh, Madam Chair, if, uh, is there, if, is there sure. for questions? Are there any questions for the chamber team? Alderman Hammond? Uh, just have one. In, in one of those ones I think it's more of just so the general body knows we've had these conversations as we were going through this but um, obviously we're responsible for the room tax dollars and the allocation thereof of those room tax dollars and we're accountable to the to our constituencies for how those are spent before we knew we had Amy and George how are those going to be allocated so if we were to get you know audited per se um, we would be able to say this 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 and that um, was used towards tourism under this new integrated model. By the way, I like it, I agree with it, but again, from an accountability standpoint that we have, how is that gonna be accomplished? Well, as, as we had mentioned, Don, I mean, if, if the idea is, is hiring services, and we've talked about this internally, mm -hmm. you know, are you hiring hours or are you hiring outcomes? You know, if you went to a marketing company, you would basically be hiring a service for somebody to go and do these promotional pieces. We'd be bidding on the process and say for, X amount of money, this is what you will get for the X amount of money, and then have the accountability for success. We do intend, and I believe, Betsy, you have a meeting uh, set up with uh, finance? Okay, well, with, with Jim. Uh, we will work to uh, identify and, and meet the, the stewardship responsibilities f that the city has on those, those dollars. Now, understand that the component of those dollars, uh, uh, right now, I believe it's about half, Amy. Half is in administration and half is passed through to purchase media. Right, but but that may change in a couple of years. And I know I did hear through the grapevine that there may be some concern that as the the tourism dollars that there, I, I think there's a Blue Harbor program or something that's coming off that may put more money into tourism. But the administrative part now there may be increments of of additional administrative costs because the hole is a little bit bigger. But the vast majority of those dollars are going to go out for outside promotions. And those are auditable. Those are expenses that we keep track of and that we're willing to furnish whatever documentation we need to, to meet our responsibilities to the city. That's great. I just wanted the body to understand that you know, we are going to be keeping score. You know, yeah, I think that actually was the biggest from, concern. Right. Um, and, and, and kudos to the, uh, uh, the, 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 the folks uh, in the city that took that responsibility and, and personally as a taxpayer and a, and a community citizen, I wanna know that uh, people are taking care of business and we appreciate the fact and we, we didn't wanna surprise them. Uh, unfortunately, I think we did. Hopefully, you know, we can make amends. We're not perfect. I can't tell you the number of times things don't go exactly the way you want. Doesn't mean the intentions were bad. Doesn't mean that the outcome is gonna be bad. It's just the process was not as good as it should have been. Any other questions? Chamber team, thank you very much. Thank you Steve. very much. Appreciate your time. <clears throat> um, let's move on to agenda item 2.2, presentation by Siegel Gallagher on the wave breaker options at the marina.
Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Council. I'm John Matheson. I'm with Siegel Gallagher Management Company. We, um, by the way, also go for our division as SG Marina. It is set up specifically for the management of marinas. So you may he hear that name uh, locally around town as well. But we're here tonight just simply to present to you um, uh, a little bit more information about the damage that happened to the marina this year. We had $350,000 worth of damage uh, to the docks. Um, and additionally, there's an average of about $45,000 a year damage prior to this year's. So when you factor in this year's, it's, it's much higher. We want to talk about the conditions that exist that bring that damage about and a recommendation that we have to, to start to address that in the future because we think it is important that, that we face it and, and find a way to fix this uh, in the long run. Uh, so I, I, I'm going to try to not be too boring on this part, but I think it's important that all of us understand the, the type of waves that are occurring there uh, and because once we understand that, we can address the fix. So I'm going to talk briefly about the wave formation and what happens in the lake to, to bring this about. Um, and this, this won't be too long. Uh, for the waves that are occurring here to happen, we need five ingredients. And these are not just little ripples across the surface that we have. These are fully developed waves that come from a large body of water. We need wind speed. You need an, an uninterrupted distance for that wind to occur, and that's also known as a fetch. You need a, a wide body of water, and Lake Michigan certainly has that. You need a sufficient duration. A, a storm that blows through in 15 minutes is not going to create a fully developed wave. You need depth of water, and Lake Michigan, again, certainly has that with hundreds of, of feet of depth. What this well, uh, what this causes and uh, creates is a is a fully developed wave. For instance, if you have sustained winds of 25 miles an hour for the period of say hours or a day, which ha happens often across the lake, you can easily get a 10, 12 foot wave. Here on this slide, we we show the, the fetch again. It's going across a large body of water, which starts off as ripples, but as it goes for many many miles, that wave grows. Uh, what, what this demonstrates is the distance that, that we get these waves traveling. It, not gonna work. Right, it's not going to work. Okay. But the point is down by Michigan City at the southern part of the lake, the southeast part of the lake, to Sheboygan, it's about 146 miles. That's how long you can get a wave developing <coughs> that starts off with a strong southeast wind. And this is the type of wave that Sheboygan is most susceptible to. That's the largest waves. It's the widest body of water. It's the longest fetch coming from the southeast part of the lake. Briefly, this, this slide shows uh, the swells that developed. And again, we're talking about a, a large swell. That's what occurs in, in our marina that causes the most damage. And it doesn't even have to happen right here in Sheboygan where you get a storm. This slide shows that if you have sustained winds in the middle of the lake, even and you have a fully developed wave, even after those <coughs> winds stop, if you look to the right, those waves change to a swell, and they continue to move in the direction of, of uh, the city and the harbor of, uh, of Sheboygan. This is important to understand because the, the, the key point is that as these waves approach, they're not a surface wave. These waves sustain a tremendous amount of energy that goes well below the surface of the water. When it does hit a harbor, as you show in this slide, it doesn't just stop. You just need a small opening, and, and that wave will, will spread out throughout the entire marina. This is a kind of complicated slide, but again, this is just showing that, that in the middle of the lake, the, the wave is, is contained to that top. It depends how big it is, 20 feet or so. But as the wave approaches land and you get to shallower water, as it says here, in shallow water, wave action does not decrease with depth. In other words, that wave, that wave sustains that energy well below the surface. And that's important to understand as we talk about solutions here. Now, this is Harbor Center Marina. And Chris is going to talk to you a little bit about what happens when these waves I'm describing, these fully developed waves, approach the marina from the southeast. 
Thank you. Uh, I, I'm Chris Marks, uh, manager of the Harbor Center Marine. I've been there for almost 18 years now, working with C.D. Gallagher. Um, for the last 18 years, I've uh, been able to firsthand witness what's happening and see it um, front line. Um, there's a culmination of things that, that, that come into play when we get the, the percentage-wise, the, the worst amount of damage. And as John was, was uh, alluding to, the southeast wind is, is our nemesis in Sheboygan. Um, what happens is, is um, we, we, each winter we have ice in the harbor. Uh, this year, particularly strong, it was uh, 40 inches thick. Uh, when we have the, the southeast winds, um, they have a, an ability to, to, to reach into our harbor just the way that this is designed. Um, and these large swelling rolling <coughs> waves, um, if you will, have an uh, unrestricted line to go right into the harbor. And that's when the damage occurs. Percentage-wise, you're going to have a little bit of uh, thermal expansion is another um, common type of damage that marinas experience and that's when there's cracks in the ice and when it warms up and it refreezes it expands okay but all those little cracks in the ice are, are what's what's really um, detrimental to to our marina is that they're going through the rolling um, rolling uh, through the marina uh, un, un, unblocked if you will um, and causing the, the, the docks to get twisted, bent, uh, expand, contract, and, 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 and damaged. Um, again, I don't have a pointer, but the southeast winds, uh, we can go back, we keep records locally at, at the property, um, are the wind um, conditions that, that, uh, that cause the damage, um, percentage-wise, the greatest amount of damage. Um, there's another phenomenon that, uh, you know, you have the Sheboygan River that's, that's exiting right at the entrance of the harbor. Um, if you have a southeast wind, and I keep saying southeast, it's the wind that's coming directly in the chute, the mouth of the harbor. Uh, when it comes in, you've got this opposing force that's coming out with the river that's constantly flowing. Um, that also exacerbates the problem and, um, you know, bottlenecks and, and enters the harbor um, at a greater rate, you know, you get those two forces coming together. Um, so the um, the phenomenon that happens is isn't just winter too. We see it in summer. Sage waves uh, is a term that that uh, is common on Lake Mi Michigan, and um, that's a phenomenon where you have wind conditions that hold water uh, in a wave format or a swell and then release it in another direction when the wind changes. Um, we've seen them, I see them at the marina all the time. Um, the, the, the water that comes into the harbor, <coughs> the inner harbor, at the entrance of the marina um, can look like a, 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 a river, a r river uh, rapid. Uh, it comes in so fast and that's because it's uh, um, completely un unblocked coming into the harbor. Um, there's, uh, um, as you can see on the, the, the break wall design, if you draw a straight line from the entrance of the harbor in, there's very little to stop it at that very entrance uh, by the Yacht Club. Um, and that's, uh, that's a concern uh, that we have here today. Um, we've got some slides uh, of other harbors. Just a quick couple examples of uh, how these uh, other harbors look. Step out here. Um, this is uh, this is Waukegan. Uh, they are uh, on the southern part of the uh, the lake, um, and we're just going to thumb through these and give you an example of uh, other marinas and how they are are protected uh, as compared to Sheboygan. Um, again, the uh, entrance of this harbor is facing south. It does have a little extenuation on the uh, the break wall. Um, there's not one direct path of, uh, of the lake that, that can enter directly into this harbor. This is Winthrop Harbor. Uh, you'll notice this is ultra protected. Um, you can see the, uh, the boats have to enter in or the wave action in that, that in this case has to enter in and go around a, a complete 180 uh, turn to get, to get into the harbor. 
in Kenosha. Again, the entrance of their harbor is facing south um, with the, uh, a complete uh, um, 45 degree bend coming in uh, to protect their entrance. This is Racine. I'm going to actually have let John uh, talk about that one since he knows that one very well. Racine is an interesting case in that there are some similarities with the Sheboygan's uh, Harbor. Uh, and that is, if you note, um, at the main break wall leading to the, the harbor entrance, there is a slight angle from there. They extended that, that wall at the harbor entrance to prevent the problem that is occurring here in Sheboygan um, so that you don't get those large waves coming in. So that was an extended, I believe, in 1987 um, uh, to prevent what, what is happening now. Uh, but this was set up very much like what, what Sheboygan has now um, back uh, uh, almost, what, 27 years ago or so. And, and I, I want to also point out, uh, we also manage uh, the marina in Racine here. There's 921 slips, and that marina was completely frozen in this past year. Uh, and that marina sustained about $6,000 worth of damage. And that was the first damage they've had in many, many years. And that was big for them. They normally don't get any damage, even though they're always frozen in every year by comparison. Just, just another note on uh, Racine, they also have floating do docks, which is in sim similar construction to ours. Um, there are a couple other marinas up and down the lakes that have the exact same dock manufacturing, uh, uh, or dock, um, dock manufacture is the same that we have that uh, sustained uh, far less damage than we did this year particularly. Again, uh, McKinley uh, Marina in Milwaukee, again, look at the break wall. Um, that they have, I mean, they're almost 100, uh, 360 degrees uh, all the way into their dock system, um, protected. Uh, Port Washington, uh, again, they've got uh, um, uh, a fairly, fairly substantial uh, system uh, in place with their federal and, and local break walls. Um, one, one item with Port Washington uh, to note, too, is that they actually have uh, a, an advantage with their power plant that, uh, um, uh, that, that pushes warm water out through their, their outtakes of their um, plant, and it keeps the, the harbor almost uh, ice-free um, for most of the winter. Um, nice if you have it. Um, if we, uh, Chris and I studied these marinas quite a bit. One thing we noticed with Port Washington, too, it's set up in a very similar way to what we have here in Sheboygan, but some important differences. One of them is, if you note where the boats are in relation to that marina uh, break wall, they're far, much farther back, and, and a wave would have to come around that bend almost 180 degrees to, to reach those boats. But when you go back, when we see Sheboygan's marina overhead, which you'll see in a minute, the boats are right up at that entrance, and that makes a big difference. Uh, Manitowoc Marina, uh, federal break wall. Uh, they did add another uh, section even on their interior. If you can kind of see the entrance of their, their main federal break wall is southeast as well. Um, but you can see that little lip that they added on later. And... Um, for the almost that same reason, because they were they were having issues. Um, again, Harbor Center. If, again, I, if you look at that line, the straight entrance into the harbor and what we have protecting us, and keep in mind that waves they they don't dissipate. It's uh, unless something of uh, a force acts on it. it it's going to continue to move. Uh, they do bounce, they do deflect, so you know it can be an, an easter wind, an eastern wind, um, or a southeastern wind that's going to create this phenomenon in Sheboygan, um, straight into the harbor, as as we currently sit with this uh, br break wall and rip rail design. Okay, what options do we have? There's been a few that have been tried. Uh, here's what, in our opinion, are the best options to pursue. Uh, one to not pursue is a floating wall. There are some wave attenuators out there that, that do that, where they will have a structure and they actually <coughs> float concrete hanging down from the wall. But again, these are floating, so as the wave comes, the energy, they'll just rise right up with the wave and the wave will pass underneath it. 
it may slow it down a little bit. It may help in some, what, uh, some cases, but the kind of waves that Lake Michigan generates, these large rollers, um, it will really not stop that. Anything that floats will, will not stop that energy. A bulkhead attenuator, uh, as Chris was mentioning, the federal walls, these are the solid concrete walls, concrete walls that go out to the uh, harbor entrance. Those are flat, and the waves tend to bounce off those. You can stack some riprap across those or put some type of material on those that, that kind of break that wave up almost like you would a sound wave. But again, it's, it's just a very minor fix. It's not going to stop the, the type of action that we get in the marina. What we need is a what they call a riprap wall, which are the large, large rocks um, and, and built in a wall. Or you can do it as a, um, uh, as a, as a pile wall where you have a sheet pile put in there filled with concrete. Either of those are really what needed, what is needed, because those will go down to the, the base of the of the of the lake and come up, and, th and that's going to provide a solid barrier to stop that wave action and that energy. Now, the the choices that we think you have for them are two. One is you put it at the harbor entrance to the to the whole <coughs> harbor, or you put it at the marina entrance. And uh, again, we think that the choices there, from a cost point of view, are, are probably better to put it the at the uh, marina entrance, you have uh, a little bit shallower depth there, and the, the costs of, of these walls are, are, are pretty expensive. This is a, I had a company come up with just a, a base estimate on, on what it would cost in rip wrap. These are the large rocks, even though it's showing a nice smooth straight line, this simply represents where that rip wrap wall would be. When you see those rock walls out there, what you're actually seeing here is just the top of that rock wall. Note how far they extend out into the water. Uh, 108 feet just to get a 12-foot wide wall. You need it to be 108 feet at the base. And this is based on a 24-foot height uh, wall. Um, that's 47,000 tons of rock. For This is based on a 400-foot, lineal-foot rock wall. It costs us $2.5 million. So it's not cheap. So the essentially what we're... Uh, Bringing up to to the council here is is not a question of whether or not to spend money on it because we're already spending money every year. We are spending money, and we're also uh, what Chris is having to do is deal with boaters that are uncomfortable whenever those conditions exist during the summer. Then he's having to spend a lot of his time having handling repairs in the spring, which is a critical time for him to get the marina ready and doing events and marketing and other things. And he's basically being a construction manager every year and getting the docks fixed. It's a, it's a major drain on marina resources for staff, and it also causes the docks to dam it to become deteriorated much quicker than they naturally would. Again, by comparison, Racine is 27 years old, and those docks are in really good shape. Here in Sheboygan, they're about 20, and they are in much worse shape than the ones in Racine. They're literally falling apart and because of this condition. So, uh, again, I think that all of us here, are, we're committed to the marina. The city's committed <coughs> to the marina. We all recognize it provides a tremendous economic benefit for this community, uh, and we want it to be around and very viable for a very long time to come. Uh, we're simply bringing this up that we would like to continue to pursue options and costs and, and try to come up with uh, the best solution um, uh, for, for making sure this marina is uh, viable for a long time and fixing this problem. Very good. Thank well, you. Questions? I have a question. Yes. I, regarding the, the different solutions, you, um, you talked about federal versus municipal uh, break walls, you, the whole structure. Um, has the Corps of Engineers weighed in on any of this? Like, oops, we screwed up when we built the, the break wall in the first place, or, you know, the, the federal portion. Uh, have they said, well, here's what we think you should do differently, or? Uh, the Corps has not done that that I'm aware of, and, and normally they, they they may not necessarily do that. They, they wouldn't are, they, we would we have asked. They would have to give per permission for anything to be done. would have to go through the Corps of Engineers. Um, but I don't think that they've stepped forward to admit to any fault, unless you've heard of anything, Chris. Chad? Chad? The core, is under, the core understands that they have an issue in their hands, too. They've raided every harbor up and down the uh, coastline and have given these docks, these breakwaters, either a D or an F rating. Um, 
so they they just don't have any federal funding to take care of maintenance or even rehabbing them. So to go to the core, I mean, they would weigh in on, on a design, but they're you know they know that they're they're walking on thin ice basically with their current um, setup as well because they just don't. Have My point for asking is, if they, it, let's say that situation changed at some point, it, you know, and if we end up adopting a solution, we spend all kinds of money on it, you know, it, are we going to run counter to what they had in mind? It, well, I, if I mean, some of that comes up in the permit process, right. I get that. Right. But <laughs> I don't know that they have a lot planned, and I think, you know, what this was to be built. We have to convince the court that they're going to weigh in on the design at that But as from a funding standpoint, um, you know, they've looked at their breakwaters, and there's places in the, in the South Pier breakwater that's you know completely undermined, and, and we just don't have the resources to take care of them. Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, could you bring another slide up that shows the Sheboygan? The uh, Sheboygan, and then kind of show us where the uh, the two point five million dollar investment would potentially. It's a hundred. I understand it's going to be a hundred feet long. Is it going to be right out at the end? It's about four hundred lineal feet, and what what Chris and I felt would be the best positioning would be at the marina entrance. If you see where the there's the overlapping walls right before you enter into the marina. Okay. Uh, it would be. A, a straight 400 foot long wall that extends out um, blocking that 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 entrance um, or not blocking it but but creating a, a um, an additional barrier for those waves it's the best blockage point I think. okay gotcha yeah. now I want to be clear we're not experts in wave attenuation there are experts out there we know enough to kind of analyze the problem and make a suggestion on what we think the direction should be but before anything is the, the next step, in other words, we should consult with with somebody who is an expert that, that does this for a living. And there are a number of companies that do nothing but this type of work. If I could just follow up, uh, Alderman Hammond, uh, the projection is $2.5 million. Uh, are there any funds available, or would this be something that we would have to bond for? Depending on what the body decides, for, decides to do, um, we probably have to bond for it. We do have money in reserves, um, you know, that we could use for this uh, if the council took set action to do that. Um, but it would probably have to be bond for. Thank you, Mayor. The original project uh, saw some money uh, from coastal management. There's also harbor grant money that's out there. So if we do put a project together, we'd at least have a chance to apply for some of those grant funds, and those could assist us if we would decide to do this. Chad? After this year, the volume went up uh, closer to 65, 65 for average. For average. Alderman Bellinger. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I've got a couple questions. Number one, um, <coughs> out of all the marinas that you guys have looked at, did ours sustain the worst damage And uh, this past winter? And do we have continually the highest um, annual repair rate? Um, among the other marinas and secondly should we go through and, and do this um, how long would this project take and what time of year would it take place and how would that impact your operations during that period of time I could answer the first just about th th this is something I noticed this spring there's a magazine called Doc Age magazine and uh, there's a couple magazines out there and they note a, n a number of issues of this 
type of uh, relevance. Um, and I think this was the most damage sustained anywhere in the nation for dock damage. I really believe that there was, because they list a number of things, this hurricane damage here and that type of thing, this was uh, by far more than any other marina in the Great Lakes, and I didn't see anything in that magazine that, that addressed it nationally. This is a national magazine, and it had a, uh, an article in there about it. And as I mentioned before, I know Racine was $6,000. Um, I don't know that Winthrop Harbor sustained any. As far as the timeline to do this and when and the impact it would have on your operation? I don't, th and Chris, you might be able to speak to that, but I, I, I know that uh, in Racine they just added to a wall entrance there and they, it was a, a three-year project and it didn't have any impact on it. Um, you know, the barge will be there. It was a three-year project that Racine had okay. uh, beefing up their, their fishing pier right by the harbor entrance. So there you got a big crane lifting up these rocks and dropping them into place. Um, and so that's, you're still going to have the ability for boats to get in and out. These, these companies that do this type of work typically understand, you know, the, the, the seasonality of the businesses and everything and, and do things in such a way that, you know, kind of like the dredging project was done in Sheboygan to not inhibit uh, or cripple the businesses while they're doing it. So they would do it during the season and, um, in a fashion that would work with our business. And, and water access for all of, you know, Sheboygan County for that matter. Mayor. Uh, previously, Dave Beeble had brought to us a suggestion that we may want to consider uh, putting concrete piers in when we replace our piers rather than the wooden piers. If those were in, would this still be needed, or would uh, that be a sturdier structure that could withstand these waves you're talking about? What do you think about that, Chris? Um, I, I think that if we could get a manufacturer to, to give us a warranty on ice damage, that it, it would be a fantastic, but I don't know how realistic it is. The concrete docks are, are, um, are, are more durable, um, but I think that anybody that would come in knowingly know the surging that happens, um, they, they, would, they would be better rigid, rigidity-wise, I think, initially, but what happens with concrete docks is when they are damaged, the fix costs twice as much more than fixing wood docks. And so, again, back to our point of this presentation is that until we stop this swell, um, moving into the dock selection would be kind of the next phase um, of, of this. But concrete docks definitely are an option to certainly explore further, um, see how it would complement with the nature of, of this design. And I assume you're talking about floating concrete docks yes. rather than the fixed concrete. Yeah, the, the, those are being installed right now in Waukegan. Half their harbor has got these concrete docks. And I walked that marina this spring, and they're, um, you know, they're they're basically concrete sections that are set in place where you can get a whole big piece set in place. But they're still on a frame that's made of uh, steel frame, but thin steel tubing that can bend and twist in this kind of uh, uh, condition with the ice. So I, 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 they're still at risk, I think. Alderman Dassler, um, kind of following up on the mayor's comment, is there any? Um Guarantee warranty on the 400 foot wall and its longevity or in, in its life expectancy? Because um, if we do the math, if we're going to say we're averaging even the high end of $65,000 a year, um, we'd be even in <coughs> 38 years. So if the wall lasts 30 years, we're probably actually better off making repairs every year than putting in a wall for 38 years. So I'm just kind of curious on. on uh, do we know how long these walls last, you know, things of that nature? Yeah. The, the walls, to answer that question, the walls, I mean, they, typically I think they engineer these for 100-year depreciation. Um, we're dealing with a violent, you know, uh, environment that, that constantly changes with the river silting and moving and the wave action moving. <coughs> so that, that time frame can change, can fluctuate. Um, but in, in theory, that's kind of the thought process is, is that, Okay, we're building this this wall, um, you know, with this stone and this design um, is about a hundred years. Um, I think also there's a cost that should be factored in, and that is the depreciation on the docks 
uh, as well because you're looking at replacing your docks much quicker and there's a several million dollar investment right there um, that you would have a couple million dollars I would assume anyway uh, to do that so you're uh, then the other cost is and this is something that I've discovered working with Chris and understanding how the, the marina operates there's a tremendous um, uh, amount of uh, time required for the staff to handle these repairs every year it's, it's a tight time frame between when the ice melts and the first boat comes in anyway you throw in the fact that you have to make repairs this year was really heavy but even at forty-five thousand dollars that's a lot of repairs and he's focused like I said he's a construction manager when he should be focusing on what can I do to make this a better experience for boaters how do I Im implement programs and marketing and but he's basically a construction guy every year so it's a big big drain on his resources that we could be doing something more productive to help get more boats in Alderman Lassard thank you so much and could I just interrupt um, this meeting is being recorded for future play. Um, it's not being broadcast live, but you may want to use your microphones. Thank you so much for the information. My concern is um, as years go by, we already have compromised docking, and if the weather continues, which we have no control over, our cost to be repairing year after year may be exceeding 60000 so what would be our next step in having this program that you're speaking about looked into and, and grants applied for by um, with what the mayor was speaking of? What it, as a body, what is our next step? to Do we hire a consulting company to give us the best option? What do you recommend? My recommendation would be to do exactly that. Um, to get the numbers that I got with this, I do... I have a relationship with uh, some people that do this kind of work for a living. And we talked about what other communities are doing. Uh, the, the gentleman I spoke with, I've known for years, and he's, he does this all over the Great Lakes. Um, and he says there is sometimes money available. Uh, federal money depends on the situation. Um, and uh, you know he knows and has put me in touch with some consultants that can come up with some estimates to further get this number down. Reality is this number might be a little bit on the high end. He thinks it could be maybe closer to the $2 million range. It, it all depends, but I, I want to put it out there what you know their initial number was at kind of a, a, a little bit on the high end. But a consultant could come and take a look at it, understand the wave dynamics in that marina, and make a recommendation to see that this is the right way to go. If I, if I can speak here, I, I think the, the mayor referenced two grant programs, one of them being the Coastal Management Program. That grant application is typically due at the end of November. It's a 50% grant. It might be beneficial for us to have open discussions with Coastal Management on the opportunities and the amount of funding they have. The other program, I would believe, is the Recreational Boating Facilities Grant Program administered through the DNR that had funded a portion of the marina construction and has done some work with us on launch ramps in the past. So I think we have some timing uh, to go and talk to those agencies and see what they would have for funding before, you know, and they can even help in some of the design and stuff. But before we contract with somebody, uh, we want to make sure that we can get as much covered under grants as possible. So I would believe the next route in my mind would be for us to take your recommendations to these funding agencies and see how receptive they are and then come back to the council and make a recommendation from there very good any other comments alderman born thanks madam chair this is another money question for alderman hammond let's say the project is 2.5 million dollars we get five hundred thousand dollars worth of grants we got two million dollars left Ordinarily, the last few years for the new council members, we've been bonding for about $2 million a year for capital improvements. Would this preclude us from doing capital improvements projects for a year, or do we have the bonding capacity to borrow another $2 million if we had to for this project? We have an extremely high bonding limit if we wanted to do that. This council would have to make the decision as to whether, as a matter of policy, they wanted to go higher than that $2 million bonding limit. Um, if they didn't, that $2 million would be it for the year. Um, but the council certainly in their prerogative has the ability to say we want to bond for four million two million for capital two million for this Keeping in mind of course that that increases interest expense, you know as a drag on the general fund as I'm sure you probably know so 
we would want to make sure we do that diligently. Thank you. Good. Any other questions? No other questions? Thank you, gentlemen. We Thank appreciate you. it. <coughs> um, moving on to um, item 2.3, presentation of the initial budget. Here's how we're going to do this tonight. Um, you all received um, some preliminary figures, which I assume you've <coughs> taken a look at. Um, we're going to ask uh, Nancy Buss and Jim Amodio to come up to kind of run us through those figures and provide this basic information. To introduce, um, I'm asking um, Alderman Hammond to put the presentation in context in terms of the budget line, um, when we're going to be doing what, and so forth. So, very good. Thank you. Um, Why um, Jim and Nancy are um, on their way up, um, I wanted just to touch briefly on this because we got uh, these numbers out um, about three weeks earlier than um, our schedule um, indicated, but I wanted to give everybody an opportunity since Mary Lynn was having a committee of the whole meeting to see the preliminary budgets. Um, and so the next couple pages are that. Um, a couple, couple notes tonight's discussion is really just a summary um, of where we're at to this point. As you know, that the department heads have all submitted budgets and they've been, you know, gone through once and in many cases gone through twice. Um, and and as, uh, in, in the case of capital, um, as recently as in the last couple of days. Um, so, you know, the documents that are going to support all of this will be part of the overall budget. Um, thanks, Nancy. It'll be part of the overall budget packet that gets uh, transmitted electronically. Um, you know, for the Finance Committee on the 14th of July and then submitted to the General Council or to the, to the Common Council for submission um, to uh, the respective committees um, on the 21st. So, um, you know, tonight's again just a preliminary discussion. It's really designed um, just to kind of give you guys a, a teaser, if <coughs> you can be teased by a budget, um, but to give you a teaser as to uh, where we're at and where we stand now. So as we start progressing through the budget process and your respective committees, you know, we can look forward to your thoughts and recommendations as we try to fill these holes um, within each of your respective uh, charges. Um, so that is a backdrop. Um, I'll give it, turn it over to uh, Jim and Nancy for, um, to go through the three pages that everybody was emailed. Thank you, Alderman Hammond. Uh, I had Nancy uh, distribute another sheet that wasn't an attachment to the email, just to go through some uh, key items. One was uh, I was chartered with keeping expenses neutral to the 14 budget and also a budget that provided the same services in 15 as we did in 14. For information, uh, you see I've got listed uh, general fund employees. These are not all the employees in the general fund, but there are some that are charged into other special revenue funds. So these are the net 285.5 people reside in the general fund from a cost standpoint. Those 285 people cost uh, $28.5 million, and that is with uh, their salary and fringe benefits included. You can see that as a percent of the operating budget in the general fund, roughly 80.5% uh, <coughs> uh, of the general fund budget is people and benefits costs. And as you can also see, as a percent of the departmental budgets, um, we range from a low of 58% to a high of almost 91%, 95% as employee cost as a percent of a total department budget. The assumptions in this budget are a 2% salary increase for 2015. That's for all non-rep employees. We still have to negotiate police contracts which expire at the end of this year. The assumption in this contract is 2% for them. Uh, and we have a contract that expires at the end of 15 for fire and the last year of their contract in 15, uh, the increase is 2.5%. So that's in this budget as well. Right now we don't have any information uh, from uh, work, uh, workers, uh, not workers comp, but uh, Wisconsin retirement. So we've kept it neutral to 14. Uh, there's some preliminary estimates, estimates that might come down a tenth or two, uh, but we're not sure of that yet. We'll probably know that sometime late July. Um, 
On the health insurance side, not baked into this budget yet, but we are looking at benefits that we have to uh, get our arms around here in the next 30 days. Uh, some of the possible things that we might do would be to increase deductibles for single and family plans. Uh, contribution levels would probably go up from the 12% level in the 15 to 15 and 18, and also increase spousal coverage. Um, currently, we charge $50 a month for spousal, and we're looking at uh, somewhere in the vicinity of $100. If we look at what those mean in savings, it could potentially mean $350,000 in savings um, that would be applied to the health fund, but we would bring those, in effect, back into the general fund uh, to offset those costs. The next page I'll go through is the preliminary 15 budget summary. And again, uh, <clears throat> this is just a recap of where we're at, uh, and things that we know, or potentially things that might happen in 2015. From a revenue side, we know that uh, the garbage fee expires in 2014, so that puts uh, a revenue shortfall of $869,000 in the 15 budget. Uh, from a revenue side, um, We've seen in 15's budget an estimated increase of $25,000 in parking tickets, uh, about a $49,000 increase in uh, city development uh, permitting fees. Um, the change in CDBG accounting is both on the revenue side and the expense side, so they're neutral. Uh, this is so that people understand that we do have federal funding and we do charge parts of our employees for the administration of it. So. As that funding stays the same or gets cut or increased, <coughs> these numbers could go up or down. But right now, we have about $162,000 of salary and fringes that are charged to CDBG that you don't see in the general fund because we're allowed to charge administrative costs to these programs for administering them. Uh, Department of Public Works for street patches and grants has another $31,000 increase in 15. And based on uh, what we projected in the ambulance side of the business, there's an additional contribution from the ambulance fund to the general fund of $101,000. Those all total about a $369,000 increase uh, in, ex in revenue. On the expense side, when we look at where we started, when you look at uh, a general increase of 2% in the associated fringe benefits that would change with it, we started out with an impact of potentially $414,000. As we went through the budget several times in each one of the areas, and one of the sheets that you'll have that I won't go through shows the detail by department for people, fringes, and non-payroll related costs and how they changed between 14 and 15. But the net impact was is that we were able to save about $172,000 out of the $414,000 <coughs> without taking any additional people out of the plan other than a couple part-timers and keeping the services the same. Uh, the largest, for sure, decrease was in the clerk's department. And again, there's two less elections last year, so we were able to save the money. But in 16, that will come back. So it's a temporary savings for 15, but it did save close to $84,000. So the total deficit we started with going in was the 869 and the 414 for a total of $1,283,000. We were able to take out of that a revenue increase of 369704 and reduce expenses by about 172000 so that the net deficit uh, as we stood with the budget was $742,000. Other expenses that aren't in the budget that we have to look at because there's potential for them. One is the death claim we have. We've been served notice. Um, we're not saying that we're going to pay a claim here, but uh, to defend that claim, the city's liability insurance says that we're on the hook for the first $125,000 of legal slash settlement costs, uh, and we believe that, you know, between either the legal costs or some type of settlement, the city will expend $125,000 in its defense of that claim. Nuisance properties, uh, I'm sorry, workers' compensation, We've had an increase over 2014 of roughly $144,000. Uh, this was an estimate uh, that we took the middle of the road from, from our workers' comp insurance carrier, which said our claims could be anywhere between $420,000 to $560,000 for 2015. 
We picked the middle <coughs> of the road, which was an increase over the 14 budget of roughly $144,000. Nuisance properties, which we've had a number of this year and we potentially will have a number of next year based on foreclosures in the city where the, the county takes over the property. These are the costs the city expends to take down the nuisance properties. Um, there's very little recovery on that because once they get into the county's hands, the county is the only uh, place where they can absolve all of the liens against properties. So they clear all the liens out, which the city is one of them. They end up selling the property at some point in the future. They may recover something for the sale of the, the land, uh, and that normally goes towards the delinquent <coughs> taxes that uh, get paid first so that the city being second or third in line never really sees the cost of uh, demoing the property to take it down to, to bare land. Uh, we've had 18 nuisance properties in 14. We think that cost is close to what, Nancy? We just did it the other night in council, $60,000 that we'll need to fund that in 2014. We probably have seven or eight that we're looking at further on this year or the beginning of next year. Um, the county is up to year 2007, I believe, in foreclosures, so we haven't really seen the bow wave from 8, 9, and 10 through the economic depression we've all gone through, so certainly there will be a lot more nuisance properties that the city will have to deal with. And then the last one is uh, my term is up at the end of August of next year. Uh, for sure, you're going to have to go out and do a search, maybe relocate somebody, so the prudent thing to do is to reserve some money in order to do that. You know, our estimate's roughly $100,000. Uh, so we would add another $419,000 of expenses uh, to the deficit of 741. So going in, we'd have a 1.1 million 61, uh, I'm sorry, a million $161,000 issue going into 15 that we would have to deal with. Just to note, um, <coughs> the next page, and that's the page that uh, shows 2013 actual through 2017 budget. Um, you can see we took the actual, we put the 14 budget in, 15 budget, and we just assumed in 16 and 17 that we'd normally escalate those budgets by 2% a year. Uh, we don't know what the CPI is really going to be. I think it's running year to date 2.1% for 14, but that's the assumption we used. Uh, more importantly, you can see where salary, fringe benefits, and other operating expenses go. In 2013 actual, um, we had uh, salary and fringes of roughly 80.15% in the general fund. And you can see over the 14 through 17, it goes up to almost 81%, 80.92%. And you can see that operating expenses continue to get squeezed as we try to continue the same staff to support the same services. So we're roughly at 19%. Uh, and that 19%, a large majority of that, as you can see from some of the details, actually in the public work side, uh, where they need materials to perform some of the duties they do to uh, fix roads <coughs> and other things they do in the parks in the city. So with that, I would open up to any questions on those several pages. Yes. Go ahead. Yes. I'd just like to <coughs> add on a, a little bit of a comment. Um, the reason I asked Jim to, to show, Jim and Nancy, to show us 16 and 17 is, you know, historically we've had it, not we, as, but the council's had a tendency to look at things, um, especially prior to my coming on board, in one-year increments. So we make decisions based off of we've got a million-dollar hole right now, so what can we do to fill that million-dollar hole right now? You know, not looking at maybe what the longer-term consequences are of, uh, of our, some of the, of the actions we take. So I guess as we go through this, um, you know, and, and we start identifying, and tonight, you know, we're, is not the night to get into those weeds, but as we start identifying options and things that we can either cut um, or revenue sources for this, we need to be cognizant of what those strategic, um, what those uh, strategic initiatives have, what the consequences of those are. You know, if we, you know, cut this service, um, there's going to be a consequence to that. You know, so we need to be cognizant of that, and that's why I wanted to look at 16 and 17, even though, again, it's just a projection, we can get a sense of where um, we're going to be at. Um, again, we're somewhat restrained <coughs> with Act 10 as to what we can raise revenue to. As many of you guys know, it's net new construction um, and about 1.5%. So that doesn't leave us a lot of room 
for increasing revenue um, above and beyond what we already have um, on, on the book. So um, it's the same thing with cutting expenses. If we want to promote economic development and all of those types of things, we have to be cognizant that if we cut certain services, that will have an impact as well. So again, that's why the 16 and 17 are on there for your perusal. I might just add another comment. I think the point uh, that Don made in, seven, in 16 and 17, just on salary and fringes, and again, assuming WRS stays constant, it's about a four hundred and twenty to four hundred and fifty thousand dollar issue every year for escalation on payroll. Um, from a services side, uh, when we look at services, there's some services we all say maybe we can outsource those; it would be cheaper. Um, the real issue is if you're going to cut a service, you have to cut the service. You can't afford to outsource it because then you're taking some cost out, but you're putting costs back in, even though they may be cheaper. It still costs money to provide those services. Um, I think uh, on the 21st, I believe, this comes back to council um, for the full budget, and then it gets distributed to committees. What uh, Nancy and I will try to do then is to take you through a couple key pinch points that we also have to go through in looking at this budget for expenditure restraints for the city and how that gets calculated, as well as our, our levy limit worksheet so that you can see how that gets calculated. Now, the information we'll have won't be current information because we don't normally get, uh, from an expenditure restraint standpoint, the, the, the state looks at a 12-month rolling average for CPI index, and they base it on October 1 of the prior year to September 30th. So we won't know what that CPI number is until sometime in the middle of October, which really is a concern, but every year we've had to wait. The league has tried to put some pressure on the state to get these numbers out and change their methodology to the end of June time frame, but so far the state hasn't acknowledged to do that. Uh, the other thing is, is we probably won't see uh, equalized values till sometime in August or September <coughs> so that we can go through the calculation of the levy and, you know, what impact that does have on rates. And normally uh, we need that as well for our levy, our levy limit worksheet. So those are kind of pinch points, but we'll take you through what we did last year so that you can see, you know, what our limits are, especially with the levy cap and the expenditure, expenditure restraints that we do get from the state. Alderman Hammond. Thank you. And uh, just as we kind of, you know, wrap up the, at least the um, presentation side of it, you know, there's a couple things we need to be considering as we go forward as well. Um, first off, I think we've talked about that, you know, there's some uncertainty with expenditure restraints. We're not also sure we have going into police and fire or police contracts, both patrol and supervisors. So we don't know how that's going to fare it out at the end of the year. Um, a couple things um, that we've got coming up. Uh, first off, the motor vehicle fund. Um, right now, it's at about 1.1 million dollars, um, and it's kind of dollars in, dollars out. So we're going to have to make some decisions as a body as to what we want to do with that. And certainly there's, there's some options out there, but give that some thought as we uh, continue to embark on this. Back in 2007, 2008, that fund um, was taken down quite significantly um, in order to fund um, pension, and that fund um, hasn't been replenished. So we have to make some decisions on what we want to do with that particular fund. Of course, the building we're sitting in, um, you know, at some point some decisions will have to be made regarding City Hall as well. Um, there's some damage and, and repairs that you know should be made if if this is going to be the building we're going to stay in. Um, and of course, in 2015 ish, 2016 probably um, is combined dispatch when we um, need to pay that um, sum of money out to the county for that. We think it's probably going to be 2016, based off of our conversations with the county. But again, just something to keep in mind. So. You know, in addition to what we've talked about here, um, you know, we also need to focus on those couple items um, that will be of importance coming up in the next year or two. Now that everybody's impressed. Capital. Uh, we've had capital reviews. Uh, we started out with 2015, excluding the motor vehicle fund of about $8.6 million of requests. Our normal funding is $2 million, so um, there's a big job in front of us. Uh, to do that, as well as uh, we skinnied a list down on the motor vehicle fund, and currently, based on their needs, it's about $1.1 million in addition uh, to that for the motor vehicle fund. So, 
just keep that in mind. Uh, once we get that wrapped up, we'll be making a presentation to the capital committee um, to start looking at what we want to fund and which projects have the priority. Questions? Alderman Cobb? Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I keep hearing this one and a half percent. What dollar amount is that? Uh, it's one and a half percent of our levy. Our levy is 21.6 million. So it's about $320,000. That's the maximum we could raise taxes. Other questions? Alderman Boren? Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, <clears throat> Jim, as I look at this, uh, I think the elephant in the room is uh, fringe benefits. Uh, I don't think we can continue to have 80% 80, 80 or 81% of our budget uh, salary and benefits. I'm not, concern, I'm not concerned that much about the salaries, but I am concerned about the fringe benefits, particularly the health insurance plan. Uh, <coughs> with what you're proposing doing, is that going to lower our cost as far as the overall premium that we're paying? Now this year we're paying, if I remember, memory serves me correctly, about 20,800 per family plan. With these changes with, the, with our provider, changes in deductibles, contributions levels, changes to the plan, is our exposure total dollar amount, is the premium gonna come down? Well, the caution on premium is that as you fluctuate rates, they change from year to year, so you could have drastic swings. Our intent was ke to keep the rates the same, but the benefit we would get <clears throat> from these changes would come back and net effect reduce the premiums in the general fund that they would have to pay to the health fund. So in other words, whatever the, whatever the employee contribution is right now, it's 12% and you were thinking of going up to whatever percentage you said. Uh, I guess my question is, you know, can we afford to continue to pay $20,800 per employee for health insurance? Is there a way for our 3M or M3, whatever it's called, to design a plan to get our premium more in line with what the private sector is paying for their employees? And there, I mean, that's a lot of dollars. I think I ran the numbers on that. If we would get closer to the 15, five, whatever it is in the private sector, there's about $2 million there. Mm -hmm. And you know, $350,000, and I'm, and I'm looking at the trend here, the, the trend in fringe benefits continues to go up. There's uh, some minor fluctuations, but it's not, it's not solving the problem. Yeah, but don't forget, in fringe benefits, benefits as well is WRS, and that's gone up over 2% in the last four years. So it's not only the, the health plan that, that drives it because the rates have been kept constant. What we're trying to do is over time get employees to pay more for the insurance that we have. Um, when you think about a 3% increase in premiums on $21,000 for a family plan, you're basically in effect, the employee is going to contribute out of pocket another 1.5%. Okay? If we increase deductibles, from 750 to 1500 on a single plan and 1500 to 3000 on a family plan then the employee not only pays the 1.5% increase but also picks up the extra 750 or 1500 and when we say okay we're going to give them a 2% raise oh and by the way if they have a, a spouse on the plan that could get other insurance we're going to make them pay $1200 a year for that privilege rather than 600 so there's another increase and then we're going to turn around and give them 2%. So in effect, if they use their deductible, we increase the premiums by 3%, and they have a spouse on the plan, they'll probably be 5% out of pocket, and we're going to replenish it with 2% in a general increase. So when we look at that, over time, we have to step it up and look at that. But to say that we can go from a 15% contribution to a 20% contribution or to a 25% or increase deductibles from 750 and 1500 to four and eight thousand, like some private sector plans, this is a significant burden on the employees. And I think, morally, at least I have the responsibility to look at how do we retain a workforce. Part of it is, is we attract them through the benefit plans we have. And I think that if we do something that draconian, that quickly, it has a significant impact on take-home pay for our employees and long-term 
a lot of money out of pocket if they do have medical emergencies. Well, there's also been an argument that you, you can't do to the uh, represented employees, a uh, non-represented employees, something to the non-reps and not doing something to the reps. But again, in the private sector, you can go to a, you can go to a company that has, you know, represented employees, non-represented employees, and management employees, which I'm sure you're familiar with with being in private business. There can be three different health plans in the in one company, and I don't think uh, while those employees may not like it, in the private sector, it's a fact of life. Sure. And if we have, you know, if, if we have to do more in 15 as far as affecting our non-reps, then I think we have to send a message to our represented employees that we're gonna expect more from them. Don't forget though, Jim, in the private sector, this started in the early twos, 2002, 2003, 2004, when they have to really set aside or accrue for liabilities on health premiums. So they've been at it for 10 years. We've been at it for two years. So in order for us to catch up, and get there tomorrow is a significant impact on our employees. That's, we have to keep that in perspective. But over time, we have to do that. I have, I have one other thing, Madam Chair, if I could, could and that is I was, I was a little bit disappointed uh, when I got these, these, these three sheets of paper that there were not any recommendations coming out of your office on possible scenarios on how we're going to deal with the garbage fee, whether we're gonna have it, we're not gonna have it, are we gonna have part of it? And maybe that discussion is gonna come up later. I, I don't understand the process, but, uh, and, and we also have a document in, that's being held at finance from Alderman Bellinger, Heidemann, and myself, that we, and, and a directive kind of from the city attorney, that we have to deal with this issue of the garbage fee sooner than later. Right. And I was hoping to see some scenarios out of your office of, how we're gonna deal with that if we keep it completely, if we get rid of half of it, and different scenarios having to do with insurance or whatever you else deemed where you know we could get going on that process. Um, I think we're gonna let Alderman Hammond Absolutely. respond. Absolutely, I'll take that. Um, first off, the scenarios are right here. We can all do the math and determine if we did half what it would do to the bottom line, if we did three quarters, what it would do to the bottom line, you know, the finance office isn't in a position to make policy decisions. That's what this body's got to do. So to your question, um, you know, if we get rid of half the garbage fee um, and keep half, the whole is only 700,000. 700, if we get rid of it all, it's 1.1 million. And if we get rid of a third, again, we can go do the math and see what the implications of that's going to be. So again, going back to my earlier comment, though, we have to be careful what we we wish for, and I'm not saying whether I'm pro or against the garbage fee, but from a bigger picture standpoint, like we did with the wheel tax and the sewer tax where it was fashionable to get rid of those things, we can't bring it back. Act 10 will not allow us to do that. So if it's here and we decide to get rid of it, you know, again, that's a policy decision, not a finance department decision. But I, I, would, I, would, uh, I, I don't agree with that. And the reason I don't agree with it is we have this gentleman up here that was hired to take the politics out of city government and the budget process. I'm willing to take the heat when it comes time to take a vote for whatever Mr. Amodio's office recommends. And I wanna see scenarios out of his office that if we, if we do decide to take away half the garbage fee, are we gonna have to cut police? I wanna, I wanna know the scenarios and, and, and I think we have to know that sooner than later. It's not our job to sit here and say, well, to make this work, we're gonna cut five police officers, or we're gonna cut 10 firemen, or we're gonna cut, we're gonna cut the public works department. That's not, that's not our job. Our job, hopefully, is to get some scenarios for Mr. Amodio's department on keeping it, getting rid of it, keeping half of it, and what's, what's that gonna mean? in jobs, or what is that gonna mean in the way we change the, the benefit plan? I'm willing, I'm willing to take the political heat on, on when we vote on this stuff, but I don't think it's our job as a body here to sit and, and, and for us to decide what's gonna go. We should may have a presentation, of what's, a presentation of what he's recommending 
and then we can take those recommend, recommend, recommendations, the good and the bad, and then take the vote. Uh, Alderman Boren, I'm just going to respond. Alderman Boren, thank you so much for your comments. Um, again, just to put this back in perspective, this is very much a preliminary introduction to the budget. We are not at the point where we have detailed scenarios of, uh, in fact, of, of all of our, our cost centers, number one. Number two, um, this comes to us three weeks. This, these preliminary figures come to us about three weeks before they normally do, and I want to thank uh, Jim and Nancy for their efforts in that respect. So I do think, Alderman Bourne, you may be worrying about something that that as our budget process goes on, as, as we all, those of us who've been around for a while and, and new older persons will learn, all of those things that you have brought up, which are completely valid, I think will be, uh, will be addressed as, as time goes on. And this is what we get the big bucks for, okay? So, Jim? If I might make one more comment to address uh, your concerns, Jim. Um, city department heads have spent an awful lot of time in the last six months taking a look at all of the people that they have, all of the functions they provide, enlisting them in priority order, which we've never really had before. And what they've done is just put next to those job functions and bodies the associated cost and revenue if they generate any revenue out of those functions. So that each department, when they go through the review in the committee, will have a list of all of the departments in priority order, most important to least important, and the costs associated to help those committees, if they so decide, to reduce some costs or cut some services to know the value of those services and the respective people that would have to go in order to not provide those services. We've tried in the past to say that, okay, if we've got a $1.1 million problem, it's the equivalent to 15 people. So what do we do? We equally take people out of every department. That got extremely frustrating on the council floor because everybody has their idea of where people should not go and other departments where a lot of people should go. So to take the frustration and the argument out of it by having these lists of functions and costs, each committee will have the opportunity within their purview to look at how they want to contribute to the shortfall um, in the general fund budget. I just follow up. Uh, uh, Jim, when the Public Protection and Safety Committee looks at the cost of providing the ambulance service, are they going to be looking at four paramedics on the on the cost side or are they going to be looking at all 21 paramedics on the cost side i mean if you want to do you know i know what dave beeble is going to spend for for the garbage pickup i know what chief domagalski uh is going to uh is spending for to run his patrol division so my question is when public protection and safety reviews the cost of running the ambulance service is it going to be four paramedics on the cost side or 21 what do we have today? Now we have four. What's the answer? Okay, is that is that showing the actual cost of providing that service then? Depends on how you look at it. Well, we got, 21, born, we got 21 people. We got 21 people providing the service. So how can public protection so what I, what be evaluated I, what I, without knowing the cost of the 21? What I could do then, Jim, to satisfy everybody's concern is take the fire department plus all the expenses in the ambulance service, put them together, and put the revenue on top and show the net expense. And we can do that for all of the years to show that if we didn't have one, our expenses would be higher. Because in effect, if we lost the ambulance <coughs> service, we still wouldn't lose those four firefighters that are in the ambulance service and charged there because we need them to man five stations. So, I, and I'm just well, going okay, to, I'll, I'll this, be, is, a, I'll this a, is a point I'll of order. I'll be at Public Protection and Safety to argue that point. But Alderman Boren, the purpose of what we're trying to do tonight is take a very preliminary look at the budget. And I really think that if we get into policy debates and arguments and we have just these very preliminary numbers in front of us, the hour is late, we've had some excellent presentations, but we really do need to move on. Is, is there anyone else who has any comments or questions about the information before us? Mayor? Um, I was wondering if you could just comment a little bit about how this 
at least preliminary budget, uh, satisfies the expenditure restraint program. And if some additional tax dollars, if, if we did raise taxes, is that going to jeopardize that? Well, we're not really sure. If we look at what we've got here for expenditures and add the other line items that we know will probably happen, based on 13 for 14 uh, with a 1.9% um, CPI factor, um, that CPI factor gives us about $670,000 of cost in the general fund that we could increase and still keep expenditure restraints. This puts us at about 660000 So we're really close. And in 2014, expenditure restra restraints from the, the state will reimburse the city $720,000. So we're in jeopardy of losing that, so we have to be careful. And that's a fine line. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Very good. Thank you so much for your early work. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, at this point in the agenda, I am going to uh, turn the chair uh, position over to Alderman Hammond as um, item 3.1 is mine, and I would like to speak uh, to you about it. Madam Chair, do you mind taking like a five-minute break? Is everyone okay with a five-minute break? So we'll come back at uh, nine minutes to eight. Thank you. All right, um, we'll take up item number three, or section three, 3.1, Charter Ordinance uh, number 114-15, uh, and uh, ordinance um, subject to the home rule provisions of section six, uh, 66001 of Wisconsin statutes providing for the appointment of the city attorney in lieu of the current method of elections by the voters of such office. And I think uh, all the person down here would like to make some opening comments as it was her document. Very good. Thank you. I, um, as I was listening to uh, Steve Harrison um, talk about the uh, Chamber of Commerce realignment and so forth, and he, he was talking about how business really um, is more nimble and more responsive than government. And while that may be true, because they don't have as much taxpayer money to work with as we do, um, there is a point that from time to time it's really a good idea to look at how you do business. I have looked at the city attorney position and from my perspective, given the history that has developed over the past 65 years, um, there is a strong argument to be made that the city attorney position should be, That's okay. should be appointed um, rather than elected. There is a long and interesting history of all sorts of municipal positions being elected. Uh, I don't know if we ever had a dog catcher, but if you had a dog catcher, it was, that person was elected. We have an elected coroner. We have elected clerks. And we have a, a number of elected positions that reflect the old party history, Republican and Democrat. Now, the city attorney position, like we are, is a nonpartisan non-party kind of position. But in the old days, these were Republican or Democratic kinds of positions, and you wanted to have your people in office because it uh, strengthened your party and your party's position. Those days are pretty much long gone. And we have had a long history of having an elected um, city attorney. But I'm going to suggest to you that we haven't done much electing in the past 65 years. Now, all of us sitting in these rows here are LEOs, local elected officials. And I was on the school board for a number of years and, and still kind of a newbie here on, on the city council. And there's that great day, that first Tuesday in January at 501 when you realize you're not going to have opposition and you're really happy. <laughs> <laughs> but other than those <clears throat> selfish pleasures, democracies work best when there are candidates representing different policy positions from whom the voters can decide 
gee, I like this idea better, I like that idea better, this policy is more important to me, that direction in government is more important to me. The Salary and Grievance Committee knows the history of uh, elected, uh, of contested city attorney positions. Um, uh, the last one we, the first one we found was in 1949. There was one in 1951, uh, one in 1961, and then the last, 1965, was my uh, former partner, now deceased, quite a colorful character, Bud Humkey. For those of you who know Bud Humkey, I, having Bud sitting here would certainly be pretty exciting, but in any event, uh, Bud ran against uh, Bucky Mertz and, and lost that election. Um, in 1974, the city council decided that from, again, a policy perspective, <coughs> the city attorney position, which had not been contested for some period of time, should be an appointed position. They passed an ordinance, there was a referendum, and the people overturned that decision. Um, six years later, the, the, the same council, not the same council, but the city council tried the very same thing. We're going to make this an appointed position rather than an elected position. And because of the provisions of a charter ordinance, if the council does change the charter or the overall ordinance, the kind of the home rule ordinance that Ms. Johnson was referring to, the people do have uh, the opportunity to present a referendum for an election. Um, so it's not that we haven't tried to change the appointed position, excuse me, the elected position to an appointed position, uh, it, but it just hasn't succeeded. Now, in 1980, it had only been 15 years since there had been a contested election. Now, in 2015, we're going to add another 35 years onto that. In other words, when this uh, city attorney position comes up for election, it will be 50 years, 5-0, since we have had more than one person running for the city attorney position. Now, I, I was not in town when Bucky Merce was the city attorney, but I have been practicing law with when Gary Langhoff was the city attorney and also when Steve McLean has been the city attorney. And we have been most ably represented by those two based on my own personal experience, and I think it's a generally shared perception. Accordingly, from my perspective, I'm not interested in changing this from an elected to an appointed position because we haven't had good people. I'm going to ask us to think about why do you have elections. You have elections to allow the people to determine the course that their government is going to take, whether it's the school board or the city, the state, national. So people can choose between people who have different ideas, different philosophies. Well, we haven't been able to do that now for 49 years in the city of Sheboygan because there has not been a contest. That to me indicates that at least within, maybe in 1980 it was important, but 35 years later, it's not quite so important. But then secondly, and this is even more important, elected officials look at policy. So Alderman Boren and Alderman Hammond are talking about the policy decisions that we're gonna have to make in terms of the budget coming up in the next few months. Lawyers don't make policy. Steve McLean is not sitting up here making policy about how the city should be run. In a contested election, I don't even know what it would look like. I think there should be more council meetings. I don't think the city attorney should have to be at every council meeting. I think that there should be more decorum in the chambers. I think there should be less. De what I'm trying to get at is that Going back to the old days when you had that party structure and it made a difference if the dog catcher was Republican or Democrat. These days, an attorney is a highly skilled practitioner who guides the council, the government, in some pretty rocky waters from <coughs> time to time. By appointing a city attorney, we have the ability to make sure that the person who is sitting here is the very best, the most skilled, and the best suited for the position, and we can do that by an appointment process. I will tell you that if there had been contested elections for city attorney, even in the last 10 years, I would not even be thinking about this. But when I found out that the last election was 49, 
49 years ago, and that's much older than I am, uh, or I'm much older than that, rather. Um, I'm thinking this is not, this is not an election that presents a real choice to the people. It really doesn't. And these days, the reason it doesn't is because you want a highly skilled municipal lawyer, as I said, to guide us through some you know, fairly rocky shoals. Now, so what I'm gonna urge is that we as a council adopt an amendment to the charter ordinance, making this a, an appointed rather than an elective position. If we're dead wrong on this, the people do have an opportunity to request a referendum. What does that involve? 7% signatures on a, on a referendum to change our decision. That's about 1,100 people. So if 1,100 people are willing to sign petitions, there will be an election. If we move in a timely fashion and there is uh, a, an adequate and timely referendum, we can get that on the, um, on the ballot at the November election. So for that reason, um, I, think that we can, I think that we can make this policy decision to, to move to an appointed office. Um, and, and I thought Ms. Johnson, as always, did a very excellent job of pointing out the other side of the debate. But I will say that almost all uh, city attorneys in the state are appointed, not elected. It's not the reverse. Um, and I don't know the percentage, so I shouldn't say all. But many more city attorneys are appointed than elected, I think, for the reasons that I've laid out here. So um, I would ask us, uh, as a committee of the whole, um, uh, for a motion to forward the um, uh, ordinance that uh, I have proposed to the city council, um, to the common council for the July 7th meeting. This is a change in the charter ordinance. It requires a two-thirds vote, in other words, 11 people of the full membership to approve, so again, there would be some, there would be uh, some opportunities there. We debated this matter in salary and grievance. It came forward with a three to one vote in favor. Um, we also discussed um, that we would not make the city attorney a completely at will position, but rather require a three quarters vote of the council for removal. Um, attorney McLean felt that that was fairly good insurance that in the heat of the moment, a lawyer wouldn't just be terminated. I will tell you, just based on my experience for many years, when governmental bodies have an attorney with whom they've worked with for a while, it is, it's an excellent relationship. It can be a little contentious from time to time, but people generally, believe it or not, like their lawyers and don't want to get rid of them. So I am I'm confident that the excellent lawyer that we could hire um, would be um, would not be subject to political wins quite as much as we might have thought. So those are my reasons. Um, I think uh, Ms. Johnson gave you a good sense of what the counter reasons are, um, but from that policy perspective, that's what I'm uh, advancing tonight. So um, would entertain a motion. Um, Alderman Bourne. Before we make a motion, uh, I've been enlightened a little bit more. What about the possibility of just putting this to a referendum automatically and let people decide in November? Why change it? The, the statute does provide for that. I would, you know, I... I you the timing is bad, however, because we had this debate, uh, as, as you uh, will remember, in salary and grievance. Um, um, no, I, actually, that would. I mean, if it if there were a referendum in November, um, in one way or another, if if it remained an elective position, whoever would w run for it would be able to, you know, take out papers on December first. So I, I guess my question is, uh, uh, Madam Chair, you're the one that brought this forward. Would you be, rather than going through this process of having this document to try to change it? and then letting the people, if they want to, go out and get the 1,100 signatures, couldn't we just put it to a referendum, which I would support right off the bat, and let the citizens decide in November it's gonna be a big election, it'd be a good opportunity for a lot of people to vote on it. Would, you, would that be all right with you, or would you rather do the process that you wanna do and... Let me uh, just interject um, for a moment. Madam City Clerk, what's the referendum 
pro I just want to make sure if we're going to go Alderman Bourne's route that we have the time and you know what what does this body need to do to make that happen? If maybe if Attorney McLean, either one of you guys, if you want to chime in on what we need to do if we go that route versus the other route. Maybe grab the podium. Thank you, Your Honor. I haven't looked at the statute specifically recently on that, but I think the choice would be that the council could pass a, a resolution either uh, proposing a question to be placed on the ballot, uh, either as a binding or an advisory referendum. Um, for the for the voters to decide there's no time requirements or I mean other than the six uh, I think weeks. Six I think the six weeks, there's at least the six week minimum mm -hmm. uh, to get it to the county <coughs> to get on the ballot but I I think that's probably the only time constraint okay Thank you. Alderman Carlson thank you I was going to make a motion to send this to the council with a positive recommendation Yeah, I'll make that motion. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to? Are you making I it? I am making that motion. Okay, is there a second? I'll second. A motion and a second. Now under discussion, Alderperson Cock. Thank you. Thank Born, you. is your button not working? Huh? Yeah, I pushed it once before. Is it working now? Yes. Yep. All right. Yeah. All right, Alderperson Cock. Thank you. So it's my understanding that if it's an elected position, then the attorney would need to live in the city. And if it's a position that is appointed, they can live in Milwaukee. Correct? That, that is correct. Um, the, um, one of the difficulties with the residency within the city is that um, municipal law is um, an ever more complex field of law that really branches out into all sorts of different kinds of areas <coughs> to find someone within the city uh, and that may be why we haven't had contested elections, is that that level of expertise is, um, I, it, it may be present in the city, it's, it's nothing that I'm aware of. Um, uh, my sense is, well, enough said on that. Yeah. Alderman Bellinger, and then Alderman Bourne. Thank you, Chairman. Um, question for you, um, uh, Mary Lynn. Uh, you, you make great points. You, um, you give us a great sense of history. Um, Dulcie Johnson gave us the counter, the counter to it. My question to you would be, why do you think by having it not be an elected position in an appointed position that you're going to get a greater number of candidates or potential candidates? Is it just the non-resident geography? Or is, is, is there something else that you think that you're going to, it's going to, spur a greater interest for applicants to this position. What's that? Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> when I, I would expect that this would be um, advertised from a statewide perspective, um, and um, there are people who are certainly willing to move. for an, This would be a very good job for an attorney. Um, a, this is not necessarily a money saver, because a very good attorney um, might even cost the city a little bit more. Okay, um, but it is an area of specialty that you, that, first of all, it's a hard way to make a living in the private sector. So it, most, that's why most cities have appointed attorneys because they get people who apply from all over. I, this isn't, that's not a very good answer to your question, but the, all I know is for the last, 49 years, there hasn't been any interest in a contest for a city attorney. There have not been two people who thought they could do the job who have put themselves forward before the electorate. Could I follow up? Yep, follow up. Um, would, you, would this be considered a full-time position, or would that said appointed attorney be able to maintain a private practice or his previous position as well, or not? I think this is very much a full-time job. Okay. Thank you. Born. Thanks, uh, Mr. President. Uh, Mary Lynn uh, 
if you, if you wouldn't mind answering my previous question, would you mind if it would go to a referendum right off the bat rather than forwarding a change in the charter? You know, make it a binding, I would have no problem have it going to a referendum and making it a binding referendum. If the citizens want it to be, continue to be elected, fine, and if they don't, fine. Do you have, do you have any objection to that? You know, and I've, since you first proposed it, Jim, I've been, you know, the old expression, my lips move when I think kind of thing. Um, I, um, the more I think about it, the more that may be um, a decent enough resolution. Uh, and I guess I would like to hear from folks what, what they think of that possibility. So I don't know, Steve, quite what the process is to actually, get the re you know, what legal process needs to, to be done to get the referendum on, uh, but I expect it's not arduous. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I mentioned before, I believe it would just be a simple resolution of the council. Uh, would come in at one meeting, get referred to a committee or the committee of the whole, whatever, come back to council, uh, be a majority vote on that, whether to, you'd have to come up with phrasing the question and decide whether it would be a, uh, a binding or an advisory referendum, but uh, it'd basically be uh, uh, adopting a motion or a resolution saying that this question will be put to the voters that, that Actually, I, I think I would be comfortable election. with that. I was just going to I was just going to follow up I could Mr. President uh, would you be willing to work on that with the city attorney then Mary Lynn before the Jan the July 7th meeting so we could still get it on the agenda we got a what we got a week and a half yet I don't even think we need to move with that kind of speed. We we have enough time. Yeah, it be done in okay. September. No, Still, six no. weeks. Six weeks. Six weeks. Not put that kind of pressure on the city clerk okay. and the county. Let's, okay. Let's get, if we're going to do it, let's get it done. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we got a motion on the floor, but go ahead. Oh, thanks. All the person bitter? Cheers. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, actually, uh, Alderman Belanger uh, brought up the question I wanted. Um, be it a referendum or the the ordinance that uh, Alderman Person Donahue proposes, um, I guess I'd want the, the details fleshed out a bit, yeah, that it's a full-time position versus uh, private practice or working for another municipality, that, that there'd be that level of detail in, in either route that we, that we take. If it's a if it's a red referendum that hey this is a full time gig you work for us um, and that's a, that's where I'd like to see that lead. Okay. So. Thank you for your comments, Alder Person Lassard. I have just a couple questions if you'll entertain them. With my time in it. Number one, is there any additional cost to the whole voting process by adding a referendum onto the ballot? No. There's none whatsoever. As long as we don't do it on a special election. There's no additional cost. And number two, would we make it an advisory or a binding referendum? Body to determine. So From my perspective, for, just it would need to be a binding referendum if it were only advisory. Right back to square one again. The, the position comes open in April of 2015. You start to circulate nomination papers on December 1st. So if it were advisory, I don't see how there would be enough time to to deal with those kinds of concerns. I would not be in favor of an advisory one. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Alder Person Carlson. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, with the uh, compromise reached, I, I would withdraw my motion and with the expectation that a resolution would come forward. And I would second that. Okay. All right. So we are... Uh, Motion's been withdrawn. All the people born, your lights are working. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, do you need a, do we need now need a motion to proceed with the other scenario about uh, having uh, all our person Donnie who work with the city attorney and the city clerk to get that on the uh, November uh, ballot to ask the question of the citizens? Do we go to a however it's phrased that we're going to go to a uh, 
stay with an elected city attorney or go to a uh, appointed <coughs> city attorney. Do you need a motion to that effect? I don't, um, and Steve, please jump in. I think maybe you, yourself, and other person, Donnie, can just draft that and bring it back into council. We don't need a motion to go to, to do that, do we? Or would you like something just as guidance? I got your spot, so you don't have a microphone. <laughs> uh, that wouldn't be necessary. In other words, uh, any alderman can bring in any document to introduce at the next council meeting, uh, regardless of what the sentiment is here of uh, the Committee of the Whole. So you wouldn't necessarily need a vote from the Committee of the Whole, but may may not be the worst thing to get some sort of sense of the, uh, you know, this is most of the council here. Thank you. All right. Uh, Alder Person Heineman. Thank you, President. Then uh, I would uh, make the motion to file this document. Okay. Is there a second? Second. A motion and a second. Just from a procedural standpoint, Steve, if this gets filed, Alder Person Donahue comes back with a, a resolution for a referendum. One doesn't kill the other. Well, uh, that would be before the council. You, right now, you've got a uh, recommendation coming out of salary and grievance to the council at the next council meeting that would be in favor of it, <coughs> and you could be coming out with the committee of the whole with uh, an opposing uh, recommendation. But that's fine. It's up to the council then just clean it up at then. the next council meeting to decide what you want to do. And we just clean it up then. Okay, fair enough. Other person uh, down here? Um, it, I, I think there might be some utility if you all are willing uh, to vote tonight um, on uh, uh, and the motion that I would put forward be, would be to move that uh, the council approves um, a referendum on the November 2014 ballot as to whether the citizens of Sheboygan want to retain the elected city attorney or change the uh, position into an appointed position. And so I will make that motion. Second. Binding, yes, I'm sorry, a binding uh, referendum. Second. Okay, there's a motion by all the person Donahue, second by all the person Bourne um, to uh, recommend a uh, binding um, referendum on the November 2014 ballot um, to determine whether our city attorney should be elected or appointed. All right, any other discussion? Uh, all the person Thiel. Yes, we have two things going on now. <laughs> I'm getting a little confused. The, the first motion was withdrawn, which was to approve Mary Lynn's document. I'm talking about Joe's had a motion and a second also. Second to file the document. Oh, sorry, I did not catch that's that. That's why I'm asking him. <laughs> we got two motions now. That's why I was checking to see what we're, what road we need to go. Well, oh. if we file this one, we can. All right, so let's take the motion to file first off. Thank you for pointing that out. Um, okay. Take the motion to file first. There's a motion and a second to file the document um, under further discussion. What was the advice of our attorney about doing that? Didn't he say that we had something coming back from committee? We do, and but we can clean it up at council. With the other? Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. All right, so hearing no other further discussion on the motion to file the document, all those in favor say, oh, do you need a roll call? No, nope. all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Chair votes aye, carries. Now, um, would you like to re reintroduce your motion? Or Not particularly? Possibly. Okay. <laughs> you just um, moved that the council approve a referendum question be drafted in a form of the resolution correct. presented to council for the November election. And all the person born, you still second? Yes. All right, now under discussion on the referendum. And, and, it, is and, it, was, and it was binding. And it binding. was binding, yes. Yeah. Under discussion. On the, resolution. on the resolution. All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Oops, we got a nay. Julie. Chair votes aye. Um, motion carries. Very Board good. And I will return that for the closing of the meeting. Our next meeting has not been scheduled. Um, I expect that we will have a budget committee of the whole meeting. Um, in late August, August, probably in late August, and we will let you know. Um, I just want to thank all of you for your time and attention this 
went a little longer than we uh, normally do, and I thought we had some wonderful discussion, and I appreciate it. With that, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor, state aye. 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 Motion carries. Oh, don't leave. There's a council meeting.